thank you for joining us. Fox Health Foundation brings you This Week in Medicine, and we usually try to bring you some educational time too. Uh, we have an educational mission for health and wellness. Can't do this in person, but I think we will be able to soon. We also have a wellness center. We're getting back up and running for 2022, hopefully with more classes. We have our nutrition classes, or I'm sorry, our nutritionist working. Maybe we'll have some nutrition classes. Um, but for now, we're getting started for the new year. So what came into the inbox this week? Uh, people who are still anti antigen uh, testing uh, negative but think they have Omicron. Again, that's when you might do a PCR test. People are still having frustrations with Omicron, Omicron in school. Uh, Omicron treatment we can talk about. The fourth shot is less effective. There was some research out last week. Of course, this is for populations who already did get an immune response from the first three shots. There are people who didn't, and for those people who are immunosuppressed, they do need a fourth shot, but that's a pretty small group. Uh, what's the difference between the antigen test and the PCR test? We talked about that last week. We'll refresh that pretty quick. Uh, for this week, should I take vitamin D? We'll talk about vitamin D based on a research study that was a double-blind perspective randomized trial from uh, Harvard that was released this week. So we'll get into that. It's interesting. Again, order your Omicron test kits. I think a lot of us ordered them the first day they came out. You can go to covidtest.gov uh, or this longer address. I did not get mine yet. If anyone did get theirs, let me know. Send me an email. Uh, this is my response from USPS that they were on their way. And again, that was placed two weeks ago. So if anybody got their test kits, give me a holler. So vitamin D, why did I choose vitamin D this week? There was a study in the British Medical Journal this week uh, based on a large population of patients that were given vitamin D therapy along with omega-3. Um, so we'll talk about that study in a minute. But the new normal on a blood test for vitamin D is 40 to 60. It used to be lower. That range was changed in the past couple of years. Pretty recent change. You'll see on your blood test results, if you use a Quest Lab, that the normal standard is actually lower than 40 to 60, but we think clinically 40 to 60 is a more appropriate measure. There has been some suspicion for quite a while, probably about the past 8 to 10 years, that normal levels of vitamin D, again this new normal, will decrease the incidence of autoimmune disease, maybe cancer risk, COVID risk is our new data, definitely works in bone density and seasonal affective disorder, and maybe even depression and mood disorder. So again, if you have normal levels of vitamin D, all these risks may be decreased. Um, the data on whether or not increasing your vitamin D level actually will benefit any of these risks has not been done, but there is an association with vitamin D and these conditions. Why would vitamin D do this? Because vitamin D regulates the genes that are involved in inflammation and immunity. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of that with you. Uh, we can do that in a further talk. It's complicated, um, but rest assured, vitamins, especially vitamin D in our body, has complicated pathways, but at least are directed toward inflammation and immunity. There are variations on the dosing of vitamin D. So over-the-counter standard dosing for the USDA recommendation is about 400 international units a day. That's what you will see in many vitamins. Um, but if you are asked by your doctor to increase your vitamin D intake, you might be asked to take 1,000. I would say this is the usual amount I'm recommending to patients, 1,000 international units. It's not milligrams. Don't uh, look around for a milligram dosage. You can get microgram doses of vitamin D, uh, but generally the over-the-counter dose you will see is IU international units. There are many different dosing regimens for vitamin D, so I'm not going to prescribe one for everyone. That's something for you to discuss with your doctor. Um, kidney patients or patients on dialysis would be likely to have a different kind of vitamin D. Um, a, there's a prescription dose available, which is a high dose. It's 50,000 international units, again, one to two times a week. I tend to reserve this for patients who have severe deficiency because it takes a long time, sometimes three to six months to go from a low level. And by that, if 40 to 60 is normal, low could be 10 to 20. 
So those are the patients that are probably going to get this 50,000 international unit dose. Additionally, there are some patients who really don't want to take a vitamin D pill every day. And if that's the case, you could take 50,000 international units once a week or once every two weeks. There's no way to know for sure how much vitamin D you should take. There's no uh, rubric. There's no calculation for this. Basically, it's up to what we would call clinical judgment. When I see your vitamin D level uh, and I know how much you need, for example, if you have osteoporosis, I'm probably going to prescribe you this higher dose. Uh, but if you're somebody who just doesn't want to take a pill every day, you probably could get away with taking one 50,000 international unit pill maybe every week or two. It comes in a pill form. It comes in a spray form. Some people spray it on their tongue. Uh, it also comes as a liquid form. Uh, it doesn't really matter to me uh, as a physician. It matters to you, what makes you comfortable. Do not get it from sun exposure. Um, it requires you to wear no sunscreen. If you want to activate the vitamin D in your skin, you can't be wearing sunscreen. You're supposed to be in the middle of the day getting sun exposure. This is exactly the kind of sun exposure that causes skin cancer. So generally speaking, there is a consensus among dermatologists and endocrinologists and internal medicine doctors that we don't want you getting exposure from the sun because the amount of sun that you need to activate your vitamin D actually causes skin cancer. So it's just not the safe way to go. So this week there was a British Medical Journal study on autoimmune disease and vitamin D. And I do remember from a medical grand rounds, perhaps as long as six to 10 years ago, that when the vitamin D data first started arriving, there was a very tight association with risk for autoimmune disease and low levels of vitamin D. Um, but this trial really brings the point home and it was well conducted. So the suspicion that we had that vitamin D was important in autoimmune disease is confirmed here in this trial. Again, there are other reasons to take vitamin D that are maybe not so strongly confirmed, perhaps uh, cancer risk, although we definitely know for sure in osteoporosis and bone density it's important. We'll talk about COVID in a minute. There are some other associations with vitamin D that may, with more research, come out to be tightly linked, just like autoimmune disease. So in this trial, they gave vitamin D and omega-3 uh, in a nationwide, the United States, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial. We like to see that because we know that these are medically, statistically, the most powerful clinical trials. They're not an association trial. They're not a retrospective trial. This is a prospective trial where the patients were blinded and look at the patient numbers, 25,000. That's a lot of people. The autoimmune diseases they were looking for, rheumatoid arthritis, polymyalgia rheumatica, which is a disease that happens to people over 50. Again, the average age of the patients in the study was 67. So we're looking at not young people with autoimmune disease, but older people mostly with autoimmune disease. And then this quote unquote, all others, which is a lot of other autoimmune diseases. This is a long period of time too, five years, but you need a long period of time because autoimmune diseases don't happen frequently. So you need to observe for a long period of time. And with or without the omega-3 fatty acids, they didn't seem to statistically make a difference. It reduced autoimmune disease statistically significantly by 22%. Uh, patients were given 2,000 international units of vitamin D in this study. Now in COVID and vitamin D, we have multiple meta-analyses. These are clustered uh, groupings of trials. So it increases the statistical power of your study. If you can take multiple studies, one, two, three, four, five, ten, 10, group them together and analyze the data as a group. That's a meta-analysis. There are many of these and they suggest there's an increased risk of infection if you have low vitamin D levels and low would definitely be below 20, an increased risk of severity of COVID. And we saw this beginning in 2020. This data was very suggestive. So that increases your risk. We don't have the data that says that if you took vitamin D, you would decrease the incidence or the severity. So as a primary treatment or as a way to decrease your risk, what would be better? Would it be better to decrease your risk by getting an immunization or taking vitamin D? And definitely getting an immunization. There really just is no data yet that says that actually intervening with vitamin D dosing decreases your incidence of infection or decreases the severity. Yet we do have this association that says 
uh, those patients who did poorly had low vitamin D levels. So we need a double-blind randomized trial, but hopefully we can't do this because we're hoping that COVID is gone, so we won't be able to do this trial. Um, you could do a retrospective trial in patients in an internal medicine clinic who have known levels of vitamin D and known levels of COVID incidence and severity. And that's something the Foxhall Foundation could do. Um, as you know, some of our uh, foundation uh, resources are dedicated to research. And because we have a large patient population, pretty much all of whom have vitamin D levels, we could retrospectively look at our population and see if low vitamin D levels did correlate either with the incidence of COVID infection or the severity. It would be interesting and we might do it. Now, February is tomorrow. It's Heart Health Month, and it just happens to be focused on high blood pressure from the CDC, which I did not know when we talked about high blood pressure last week. So it's encouraging to know that CDC also wants to focus Heart Health Month on high blood pressure. And of course, it's also encouraging to know that we have a cardiologist in the Foxhall Foundation who can speak with us in the month of February. So Dr. Yamamoto will give us a guest lecture in the next couple of weeks focusing on heart health. Uh, the CDC, again, is trying to focus on high blood pressure, which is what we talked about last week. So just to remind you, when do you need a cardiologist with blood pressure? Well, typically it's going to be when you're over 50, definitely over 65, because orthostasis, which is dropping your blood pressure when you stand up, atrial fibrillation, history of heart attack or risk for heart attack, comorbidities. Remember, Dr. Walensky mentioned that word a couple of weeks ago. That means other things that make you sick, like uh, diabetes, um, other medical problems, cancer, being on chemotherapy definitely changes your blood pressure for sure. Uh, and also how much plaque you have in your arteries. All of these things make it a little bit more difficult to deal with your blood pressure without the assistance and help of a cardiologist. So that's where they can be very helpful. And a lot of this help comes from assessing the dynamic function of your cardiovascular system as it changes throughout the day and in response to various activities. And again, things like other medications, chemotherapy, uh, other rhythm problems with your heart. So again, you probably need a cardiologist to help you. The benefits to treating blood pressure with medication and not just lifestyle change. Lifestyle change would mean cutting out the fast food in your diet, decreasing the amount of processed food, which is heavily salt laden. A lot of our patients in our community don't do that. It's very hard to find some of the fast food restaurants in our area because our population tends to eat very healthy and so are not eating a lot of processed foods with salt. Um, so medications may be what we need to do if we're already lifestyle optimized, which I think many people in our area are. But the benefits of taking a blood pressure pill is that it doesn't just reduce your blood pressure. It restores and maintains the lining of your arteries. It may prevent diabetes. It may prevent heart attack independent of lowering your blood pressure by keeping your arteries again clean. So it's better to change your attitude about blood pressure and think of it less punitively instead of a pill is being used to punish me as a pill is a opportunity to improve your cardiovascular health and prevent the aging of your cardiovascular system. We're not punishing you, we're providing you an opportunity to have meaningful statistical benefit from taking medication that improves your cardiovascular health and prevents cardiovascular aging. So again, the home cuff versus the office cuff uh, assessment, please don't use the wrist cuffs. Uh, bring your cuff in with you to the office and then we'll match up your cuff versus the blood pressure we get in the office. Uh, the home assessment misses the organ damage assessment that we need to do in the office. So that's another reason why we don't depend on your home blood pressure cuff. What we're really depending on is further evaluation for the end organ changes in your body that happen. Uh, we're still not leading an Omicron. I had to throw in an Omicron slide. Uh, we did peak. We're still 50th in the United States and DC and Maryland are also at the bottom. So we're in a wait and see mode right now. Again, the practical guide to testing because people still have problems and I still get some positive test results reported to me. Uh, if you're exposed and you have no symptoms and you have the antigen test available, you could check it. Uh, if you urgently need to know whether or not you are uh, infected, you can do the PCR test. 
uh, but we're really not using too many of those now because people know that they have Omicron. It's not necessarily subtle. Uh, and then once you have a positive antigen test, don't do it again. You're positive. Now you're waiting for a negative antigen test. So to prove that you are no longer contagious, you'd want to do two negative antigen tests uh, day five to 10. And again, not too many people are getting two negative tests day five through 10. So don't be surprised if you don't. And don't be sad if you don't, because I think beyond day 10, you won't be contagious anymore and your antigen tests will be negative. When to use the PCR test again, if you need it for a preoperative clearance, uh, don't use it to prove you're free of disease. Remember, it can be positive for two months, picking up particles of RNA from the virus that are no longer contagious, but still exist. Here are some of the rapid tests. Uh, I don't know which one we're going to get from the federal government. Uh, again, you can pick these up at the local public libraries. Again, remember your mask is more effective if you're wearing an N95 or KN95, and I'm very pleased that there are more and more people wearing these. They're now being given out at pharmacies, at public, uh, public schools, uh, and even some uh, local libraries. Omicron Therapeutics, uh, remember it's been halted for Regeneron because it doesn't work against Omicron. Citrovimab is still being given, Paxlovid is still being given. The problem with Paxlovid is it does have some important medication interactions. So most people are going to stop taking their Lipitor or Statin for a couple of days before and after they take it. You also need to reduce the dose in kidney impairment. Um, so if Paxlovid has to be reviewed by a doctor and has to be recommended by a doctor. And again, these drugs are really for people who are at risk for severe illness, at risk of being in the hospital. A fourth shot, generally no, you really need to get this information from your oncologist, your immunologist. Most people are still not going to get a fourth shot of our COVID vaccine that was based on COVID-19, not Omicron. So uh, I think everybody knows Pfizer and Moderna are working on an Omicron vaccine, but we're not going to use the same vaccine that we used to begin with. Um, is this our COVID silver lining that Omicron got rid of Delta? Looks like it, doesn't it? So this was, you know, December 6th, and now we're at January 31st. And it's unlikely that we have too much Delta circulating in the United States. The question is, will it come back? Again, wear your mask. That's U.S. versus Omicron and U.S. versus continuing respiratory viruses. I'm just going to repeat Tony's tip of the week last week. It's so important because it's already happened again where I didn't get medical records. Someone was in the hospital or the emergency room. Um, you can even ask a family member to call the office and let us know because uh, we can often get medical records through computer systems. But if we don't know in the, you're in the hospital or we don't know you're in the emergency room, we can't get the records. So fast pitch, remember blood pressure is just a number. We have to contextualize it and find out why it's important to you. And your high blood pressure may be somebody else's low blood pressure. So it's very important that we individualize it. Revisit your mask habits, um, upgrade your mask. It's not too late to get your flu shot. We're not seeing much influenza, um, but again, you can still get it all the way through March. Consider your vitamin D needs and your status. Uh, almost always when you come in for an annual physical, we can talk about this because the blood test is something we order standardly given how important vitamin D is. And if you want to, even though we thankfully don't have much Omicron left, you certainly could go to covidtest.gov and order your um, test kits. And if anybody got their test kits yet, let me know. Again, remember your health pyramid. It definitely helps people get through COVID and get through cancer and get through heart disease. If you have all of these things humming along, up to date and addressed on an annual basis. And we have our book that's still available. And finally, please subscribe and hit like. Um, our audio visual uh, assistant would like you to subscribe. Uh, if you don't have a Google account, please click on the link that will appear shortly in the top right corner, and that will give you directions on how to make a Google account. And then you can subscribe and hit like. Thank you very much. Have a good week, and I'll see you in February.